Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joining the line later today by Lou Schuler. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, what's going on in my neck of the woods, and I would just like to start with this sentiment. For anybody that has children, this is quite possibly what feels like the longest summer ever, because even though school has only technically been out for a month, it feels like we have been out of school for like three and a half months now. So it feels like this summer just perpetually is going on and on and on and Man, I love my kids as much as anybody, but I think I can speak for all parents that have gone through this, that we are ready for some semblance of normalcy in our lives and some semblance of just routine. Because again, I don't know what you're going through right now, but between my wife and I trying to work from home, balance schedules, entertain children, and and again, it's not just for a month now, for like the last three and a half months, we are definitely ready to just find some semblance of normalcy in our life. And it's weird too, because what this has also done is totally thrown off my normal coaching routine. So normally my year looks something like this. Like I've got some a uh, handful of soccer people over the winter. I've got a little bit of a break. And then when April rolls around, I know I'm going to start getting guys back. Uh, pre-draft guys in April, Come May, I'm going to start getting my pro guys back. June, July, August, I'm cranking until the end of August. And then end of August, early September, things die down. So, I mean, you can set like a clock to the way my calendar works. And now it's just so different in the sense that, you know, I've had Glenn for eight weeks, which is in a lot of ways felt like a full off season. Had him, he's already gone. He's back in Philly. But then I've got other guys that I'm going to have legitimately from early May until like October, November at some point in time. So, you know, on one hand, I'm absolutely loving the fact that I've got so much time to develop these guys, to work on them, to help them just build their bodies. But it's just weird in the sense that you never have this amount of time with people. So, you know, while we all talk about, oh, I'd love to have X amount of time with somebody. And, you know, obviously the most or the biggest proponent of that, I love having this time. It also brings itself upon or or brings with it some newfound issues of just trying to maintain the momentum for four or five, six months of steady, continuous training without that kind of payoff of, hey, I've got a game or I got to be ready in a month. It's like, no, I got to be ready in like five months or six months down the line. So definitely an interesting time. I believe it was future said, what a time to be alive. It feels kind of like that right now, but you know, couldn't be happier in the sense that the coaching is going super, super well right now. Still buzzing. I had a great day on the floor today. I feel like had some really high quality sessions. The programming I feel like is really dialed in for these different athletes that I'm working with. And I've got not just a system, but also this freedom now to where I don't feel slave to any one system, to any one series of exercises, movements, whatever. I feel like, man, I'm really comfortable if somebody needs something that I can give it to them, even if it's off the grid, even if it's something that they've never done before. I've got a rationale behind it. I can explain it well enough. And I think most importantly, I've got enough rapport with all of these guys to tell them like, look, I've trained you now for two, three, four, five years I know what your body needs. Let's do this and let's see where it goes. So that's been really exciting. And to have that freedom and that liberty as a coach, I think is really empowering. And it's funny, I was talking to one of our interns today about this. I was just asking him, you know, so you've interned a couple places now, like what would you change about stuff that you've done in other places? And he said, oh, well, I'd change a bunch. I said, okay, and that's cool. But here's what you need to know as a 23-year-old, 24-year-old coming out, when you go into a new situation, what you don't want to do is blow the whole thing up and turn everything on its head. Like that's the worst thing you can do because now everybody's on the defensive, you know, they're not comfortable with you. You're making all these broad sweeping changes. I said a far better way to do this is just dabble on the fringes, right? Like keep a lot of the nuts and bolts in place, take out a few of the things that you're really adamant aren't helping, infuse a few of the things that you feel will be most impactful and start there. And I think if you can do that as a young coach and just find subtle ways to infuse what you're doing and to kind of get more trust and get more buy-in from your clients and athletes, that can be a huge boon for you. And that can help you get set up for the path to success or set up on the path to success 
over the long haul. So coaching has been good. Random work is kind of what I had next. Feels kind of random. We got iFastU up and running now. We got our Zoom calls going. I'm recording my first piece of content next week. Really excited about that. Talking a little bit more about the supersets that I use at the gym. Obviously, I did that big presentation on the different types of supersets. But since it was only like a 45 minute to an hour presentation, I didn't get to go as in-depth as I would have liked on some of the pairings that I'm using. So really excited to share that with the members of iFastU, working on just this massive email sequence, which I'm sure probably doesn't sound super exciting to you. But for people that go to the Complete Coach CERT website that have never been there, that don't know anything about me, it's just basically an email series. If they want to learn more about what I do and what maybe makes me unique as a coach, it's going to basically take them through that. And so I didn't expect that to be a lot of work. You know, I had this, I still have this vision of what I want all of those materials to look like. Like, I feel like the website is where I want it, but I thought the website would be the biggest part and not realizing like the website's probably the easy part for me because somebody else designs that and makes it look pretty and I don't have to do a whole lot. Now having this thought process of like, what are the most impactful articles and podcasts and videos that I've created over the years? And trying to get those in front of people because, look, a lot of people may know nothing about me. They may know they want to be a better trainer or coach and they want to learn a little bit more about my system. So what do I put in front of them? And there's definitely some thought that goes into that. A lot of work as far as crafting the emails, taking the time. Well, not me personally. I'm paying somebody, but um, getting some of my best podcasts transcribed. So as I'll let you guys know here later on, like my 19 Ninja Tricks for Better Programming, I'm getting that transcribed. My 20 Tips for Young Coaches, I'm getting that transcribed because those are just such great all-round pieces of content, and I think they can be applicable whether you've been doing this for a month, a year, or a decade. I feel like there are pieces of those podcasts that can be helpful to a trainer or coach at almost any stage in the game. So excited about that. It's time consuming. It's definitely not something that is immediately gratifying. You know, building an email funnel is not super exciting, but I think the people that come to that site later on and want to know more about it before they actually invest in the course are going to get a really good representation of who I am and what my training and my coaching is all about. So excited about that. And then I think it would be remiss to be in the summer and not talk about summertime stuff. And I know people always talk about whether it's on the gram or in my emails, they love to hear about what Team Robertson is up to. So, you know, lots of fun stuff. We're still doing all of our fun summer stuff. Friday, I had a short-ish coaching day. I just kind of grinded it out, eight to noon. It was a long week, but at the end, Kate had actually come in with me that morning. So he was at the gym for like four hours. The dude's a boss. He comes in with me to work like two or three days a week now. It's pretty funny. So he hangs out and that day we were playing spike ball. So he's like, well, dad, play, play more spike ball. I like watching you. So played like 45 minutes of spike ball. And if you know anything about Indiana this time of year, the humidity is just ridiculous. It's like 95% humidity. So I'm absolutely drenched and we decide, okay, this is a pool day. So, you know, shut it down, took the kids to the pool Had a great time there. Yesterday, or a couple nights ago now, we did what my kids deemed the ultimate sleepover. So (laughs) I don't know where they get these ideas, but they got every pillow and blanket in our house and basically made our living room into this ultimate sleepover. And so at first it started with, we want to watch or we want to watch TV and sleep down here. And Jess and I are like, great. Go for it. Knock yourselves out. And then it turned into, well, but we want to watch shows with you guys and we want you to sleep down here. So we ended up doing that. The one great thing about that too, not just obviously having that time with your kids, but going to bed when they go to bed and then getting up like later than usual, I'm always super rested. Like that's one thing about our vacations. When we set our clocks to basically theirs and we go to bed at 10 or 1030 and get up at 730 or 8. I mean, I feel like a million dollars whenever we do that. So that was fun. And then to finish off our weekend, I don't know if you know this, but my parents own a farm in Muncie, which is like an hour northeast of Indianapolis. It's where I grew up. They own like 20 acres. It's a horse farm. So my mom used to board horses. And so they're getting ready to sell that place. So a little sad in the sense that that was my mom's baby for 
shoot, I don't know, 25, 30 years. So a little sad, a little very nostalgic going back there. They've rented it out the last five years. So we took the kids up there yesterday because they're in town from Florida, fixing the place up, getting it ready to start showing it. So that was fun because just sharing that with my kids, having that time with my parents, because obviously they're not here all the time living in Florida. It's not just, hey, let's get in the car and go see grandma and grandpa. You know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to see them and catch up with them. So that was really good as well. So that is a somewhat short, (laughs) short ish synopsis of the weekend. What's going on my world? Like I said up front, I hope you're doing well. And without any further ado, let's jump into this awesome show with my boy, Lou Schuler. One thing Bill Hartman and I have talked about for years now is the power of mentorship. Early on, I didn't have a mentor to shape or guide me or most importantly, help me find the blind spots in my own training and coaching. But luckily, after many years of trial and error, I found Bill, and my professional success exploded as a result. But the downside to the mentorship process, at least professionally, is that it can be pricey. For private mentees that I work with, it costs anywhere from $3.99 to $5.99 per month to work together. And while I know the results go far beyond that price, the fact of the matter is that just won't work for a lot of folks. So when Bill and I sat down a while back, we asked ourselves a really tough question. How can we help shape the future of the industry and truly make it great? And beyond that, how can we create amazing content yet make it affordable to virtually every trainer or coach out there? And the answer for us was simple. Restart iFast University. Here's what you'll get when you become a member of iFast University. One update each month from myself and Bill. This could cover anything from improving exercise technique to writing better programs and everything in between. Twice per month Q&As, where Bill and I will personally answer your questions to help you become better at training, coaching, or even running your fitness business. A Facebook group where you will be surrounded by like-minded trainers and coaches who are serious about getting better, and access to the iFastU archives, where you'll be able to watch literally hundreds of pieces of content from the iFast team over the years. This blend of content and Q&A is specifically designed to help make you the best trainer or coach possible. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to ifastuniversity.com to get signed on. We'd love to have you on board. Lou Schuler is a National Magazine award-winning journalist and editorial director of the Personal Trainer Development Center. He's been writing about fitness since 1992 and is the author or co-author of many popular books about strength training and nutrition, including the New Rules of Lifting series, which he co-wrote with Alan Cosgrove. In this show, Lou and I dive into the topics of communication and media in the fitness industry. We talk about writing and why even if you don't consider yourself a writer, you should be working on writing. We talk about communication skills and how to take yours to the next level. And finally, we talk about how to develop your coaching filter and why if you're just starting out as a trainer or coach, you should probably stay away from the fringes of the fitness industry. As someone that's been producing and editing content in the fitness industry for 28 years now, I think Lou has a truly unique perspective on this, and I know you're going to love this show. But enough for me. Let's do this. Lou, thanks so much for coming on the show here today, man. Excited to catch up with you a little bit. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am an old guy. I've been around for a really long time. I, right now, I'm the editorial director at the Personal Trainer Development Center. So we work with, you know, we put out what I think is really good information for personal trainers. We mainly focus on online training now. But I think that's, it's, it's, it's work that I'm really happy to be involved with. And I think it's a I think it's a natural evolution from what I'm known for, which is the books, the training books. You know, I worked for Men's Health for a long time, was associated with them for a long time. And this feels like kind of a natural evolution to go from trying to put out content for the end users of the product to the people who train the end users of of information. Love it. Love it. And what... What led you to the world of like physical preparation? How'd you get interested in weights? And then how'd you kind of morph that into a career? Well, that's a long story, but where it starts is I'm this kid who loves sports and I was, and every time I tell this story and I probably did the last time I was on your podcast, but every time I say this, I always, it just sounds like such bullshit. You know, it just sounds like some <laughs> hero's origin story, but it's absolutely true. When I was a kid, I was 
the worst at every sport I tried, but only among the kids who actually wanted to play sports. You know, most kids didn't want to play sports. Their parents didn't really push them into it if they didn't want to do it. So right. I was this kid who had to push my parents, and I was constantly I wanted to I wanted to play sports, and I was always the worst, always <laughs> at the end of the bench. I was the the weakest, the slowest, the skinniest, and you know, and I and I had these big thick glasses back before you know most of my life I wore really big thick glasses. Right and. So, you know, the thing about big, thick glasses is you have no peripheral vision. So there's like a pop fly coming to you. As soon as you look up, you're outside your glasses and now you're blind. Mm. So your eyes are kind of, you know, they, they've got like this refracted vision through the lenses here. And then you've lost the lenses. So you're just, you know, you're just like 2200 vision or whatever you've got <laughs> going that way. You got no peripheral vision. You can't, you know. Right. So that obviously didn't help my coordination. It wasn't like I was the most graceful, you know, kid anyway. But as my eyesight got worse, I got, you know, my performance. So when I was 13, my older brother, who was 15, had gotten cut from his high school football team. He went to the, this all-boys school, kind of a powerhouse program. Right. And they actually cut kids from, like, the freshman team. So he got cut. So he went out, bought a set of weights at, at Sears, brought it home. I was 13, started working out. This was 1970, and I, and I never stopped. I mean, I never, I never awesome. got good at sports until – I got LASIK surgery and, you know, by then I was in, you know, I think mid to late, yeah, probably mid forties by then. And that was like, I could actually do, you know, stuff that involved coordination and depth perception in a way right. that I never could before. And it's not like I ever got like, I mean, you know me, you know, I'm not, I, I never was as strong as you. I was never a power lifter, never a bodybuilder, nothing. But I've been training for 50 years and it's, it's like, it became such a part of my identity that. Eventually, in my early 30s, uh, I guess mid 30s, I got a chance to turn that into a career. And that's, you know, that's how I got to where I am now. I love it. I love it. So you're at the PTDC now. Talk right. to me about your career path, because, I mean, I'm still just fascinated. All the different places you've been, you maybe don't have to touch on all of them, but I would love to just uh, no, hear that, about. That would, that, that would take a couple hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. But, but a couple of the highlights in the road, you know, obviously Men's Health, T-Nation, like talk to us about that progression. Well, so in the 1970s, late 1970s, I went to journalism school. And at that time, I thought, OK, you know, I, I like wanted to be a, a film critic or I wanted to be the guy who's like writing cover stories for Esquire or Playboy, right. you know, the, those magazines that had like millions of Subscribe, readers every yeah. month. And I figured out pretty early on that wasn't going to happen. So after a few <laughs> years of working at, you know, really small newspapers, magazines, I move out to L.A. to write screenplays. I have no idea what I'm doing. I just pack up my car drive nice. out to LA to, to write screenplays, which was, it, it's like all my great stories now were, you know, from those years when I was waiting tables and like writing screenplays by day and, you know, and waiting tables at night or vice versa, waiting, you know, being a waiter during the day and writing yeah. stuff at night. So all, like all the fun stories about meeting celebrities and all this stuff happened when I was a, happened when I was a waiter. But after a few years of that, it was like, okay, that's, this has gone on way too long. I got to get back into publishing. And when I got back into publishing in the in the late '80s, it was for the first time in my life people were interested in working out. It wasn't just this. I wasn't just this weird guy who belonged to a gym or this weird guy who would go running on the side of the road and people would slow down and say, "Hey, man, you need a ride?" No, I got no. I'm actually doing this on purpose. Really? <laughs> you know, nobody had no idea. <laughs> yes. Back back then, people didn't know. So here it is. It's the late 1980s. And all of a sudden, people are interested in health and fitness and, and nutrition in ways that they hadn't in, you know, as far as the mainstream audience goes. There had always been people who were interested, but not this many people at, you know, it was never this big a trend. Right. So I go to work for a newspaper and I'm because I'm the guy who works out, the one guy in the office, I would always get these health and fitness stories. And after that newspaper went out of business and I moved, you know, I, I was in L.A., I was in graduate school for creative writing at University of Southern California I answered an ad in the LA Times for a for a fitness editor. And I'd never heard of the magazine. It was Men's Fitness Magazine. It was, you know, put out by Weeder. And I think I knew what Weeder was, but I'd never actually picked up a bodybuilding magazine. So I can actually claim that I that I started working for a bodybuilding magazine. I was a part-time copy editor at Muscle and Fitness before I'd ever even read one. Right. So that was but all everything I'd done up to then, all these years of working out and, you know, being just having the very, you know, I, I had pretty well honed writing and editing skills by then because I'd been doing it nonstop for all these years, even if even when nobody was paying me to do it. Right. 
So I was like perfectly situated to do this thing I'd always been interested in, but I had no idea I could make a living doing it. And then once I started, this was in 1992, I, I started full time at Men's Fitness Magazine. You know, 28 years later, I'm still doing it. I went, I was at Men's Fitness for six years. I was went to Men's Health, was there for six years. I was a fitness director. And, you know, and after I got out of there, I still wrote for Men's Health. I wrote books, yeah. uh, best known ones or the New Rules of Lifting series with Alan Cosgrove. Yep. But I've been able to do all this stuff because I think my working theory of this is because I still remember what it felt like to be that 13-year-old kid and to be the worst at everything mm -hmm. and to think through how that would have affected me if I was in my 30s or 40s or you know even 20s and I still felt that way if I'd never done anything about it, how would I talk to myself? So that was always my guiding principle when I wrote about fitness was – what does this person who thinks like I thought when I was 13, what do they need to know? What, what would be like the best thing I could tell them? What would be the best way to present this information? And, you know, to this day, I haven't really run out of ways to do that better than I did it the last time. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's such a great take home point. You didn't really describe it in, a, in these exact words. But as trainers and coaches, we often just think like everybody should be like us. Right. And so it's hard for us in a lot of cases to sell fitness to other people. Right. Like lower. I don't want to say lower level human beings, but people that like aren't into the fitness industry right. because we can't relate to them. Right? right. So what you just described is being able to relate to your 13 year old self that was kind of awkward, that wasn't comfortable in a gym and working out and and making that person feel comfortable and educating them. So, like, that's just a great take home point. If you're a trainer or coach listening be able to relate this stuff to people that are not like you. And I got to say, if you if you're on a if I were running a gym, I would want some people who are just like studly, you know, so it's like the guy who wants, you know, the, the guy or the woman who wants to work with like the the, the fittest, leanest, most ripped, yep. strongest person. OK, you've got a couple of those. I would also want somebody who could relate to that absolute beginner. And yep, absolutely. Even the greatest trainer is probably somebody who's a trainer because they've always loved fitness. So, you know, that doesn't mean that that person wouldn't do a great job with that with that beginner. But I always think that the person who can kind of relate to the experience of being in that other person's shoes may be able to communicate better with that person most of the time. Absolutely. I know I know. I threw in a hundred qualifiers there, but I'm just saying, I mean, there's never like one rule that describes everything. Right. But I've always felt that that was something that, that it was certainly something that helped me keep going for as long as I have, because I just, you know, I fall asleep at night and sometimes that, you know, that 13 year old or that 15 year old is still there. Yeah. And I still remember stuff like it happened yesterday. Absolutely. I love it, man. Well, let's let's jump jump in the deep end here because you do. You've got so much experience. You've seen so many like different corners of the fitness industry. For a new up and coming trainer, how do you advise them to filter information? Because I know this is something that a lot of young trainers and coaches struggle with. There's so much information out there now. So how do you help them understand like when do you lean into something and when do you maybe like leave your options open? First off and this takes time, I think you've got to be able to distinguish between what's actually information and what's opinion or what's mm. marketing or what's yep. rhetoric or what's argument. So you could spend all day going through social media of well-known people and you're looking at arguments and you're looking at back and forth and pissing matches, or maybe you're looking at somebody's marketing material, but you don't realize it's their marketing material because it just looks like a straightforward information about something that you're interested in. Yeah. And maybe you don't get, and then you get to the end and they're talking about their product and it could be a hundred percent accurate. They could have said everything they could have said, maybe everything they said in their marketing material is They've, they've, you know, it's it, it's it's based on based on science or based on their experience. Maybe they're not lying about anything. But if they're marketing something, they're not telling you the whole story. They're not telling right. you what the other side might be. They're not telling you what the under what conditions this may not be the best plan because it's in their best interest for you not to know that. And you're perfectly free to go look for that information. But I, I, I think most people don't. They find something yeah. they like, and it's like that's my thing. So if I were advising a young person is, I would stay out of 
it, it's I mean, debates can be entertaining. Arguments can be entertaining. Sure. You know, vitriol can be entertaining where people are like shit talking each other. That could be <laughs> fun. I, 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 you know, I enjoy that as much as I, I won't say as much as the next person because some people enjoy it way too damn much. <laughs> and I, I will put myself in that category. But I mean, that stuff's all OK. But what's information? It takes some time to be able to see through what somebody's motives were for writing something or promoting something or saying something or arguing with somebody else versus the motives of somebody who's trying to give you, say, a straightforward accounting of like a new study or, you know, explain how to do something in what they think is the most efficient way. Somebody could have all the commercial interests in the world, but they still may just want to give you, you know, here's here's just a great article about fat loss and it may have nothing to do with the product they're promoting. They may be just trying to engender some goodwill so that maybe you'll consider buying their product when you're ready for it. Right. So they're not trying to trick you or anything, but it's just – it takes some time to figure out, okay, is this something where – is this person trying to help me or is this person trying to sell me something? Yes. Yes. And I think – that is something that you can only cultivate with time, right? Like some people naturally have a better filter or better BS meter than others. But yeah, I mean, look, this doesn't happen overnight. And it's hard right now, too, because sometimes, especially with social media, if somebody's good on camera, they can be so persuasive, right? right. So persuasive. And you think, oh, yeah, this is this is it. And then you start to dig deeper or you go to some maybe some people with differing opinions. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, but that doesn't make sense. So it just takes time to cultivate that filter and get used to, okay, does this logically make sense? Are they trying to sell me something? Are there ulterior motives? There's a lot of things to kind of check off before you can really trust somebody to be a really good provider of quality information. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And, and the key is time. And yes. that's if basically if I'm, if I'm giving information or if I'm giving advice to any young person, it's, You've got a long time. You don't yeah. have to figure out everything right now. You don't right. have to know everything right now. You don't have to make your fortune right now. You don't have to. I mean, don't think about retiring at 40. Right. If you're, if, you know, if you're doing everything right, you're going to live to 90. What the hell are you going to do for the next 50 years? Right. Exactly. You know, don't, don't think about how this ends. Think about where it goes. Yeah. Don't, I like you that. Know, don't worry about five steps from now. Worry about two steps from now. Yep. I love it. So kind of along those same lines, you and I have both been doing this for quite some time now. What are some of the biggest shifts that you've seen in our industry over the last 20 plus years? Well, let me back up just a little bit. Okay. So talking about what advice you would give to young people, how to filter information, that sort of thing. One of the biggest red flags is the extreme information where it has to be this yes. and anybody who doesn't agree with this is therefore my enemy because they're promoting, you know, they're 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 tainted, they're they're corrupt, they're being paid off by Big Barbell or, you know, right. <laughs> whoever whoever the villain is this right. week, that's, you know, that's who they're in league with. Yep. And it's, you know, it's easy to slip into conspiratorial thinking and and all that. And I and I know that applies to stuff way beyond fitness and nutrition and health. Yes. But it's you see these all these same dynamics. And if something is so extreme that the program never fails, the user fails, that you're not good enough for the program. Right. If it's if 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 it's promoted that way where where the extreme is the, the extreme is the only acceptable version of this and everything else is corrupt and and you know you may as well not even you know may as well not even do it. That I would avoid because those the more extreme it is, the less it shelf the the shorter its shelf life. Yeah. So somebody's promoting an extreme diet, next week there's gonna be another extreme diet or next, you know, next year. If something is only promoted, if something is originates from a single guru, and this is one of the biggest red flags out there for to young people to stay away from this. If there's one guru out there, then the entire structure of the thing depends on the integrity of that one guru. And if that one guru is outed as being, you know, dishonest or or racist or, you know, or 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 treating people badly, now the whole structure falls apart. And if exactly. you've based your young career on this one thing which comes from this one guru, you can have the whole thing pulled out from under your feet in an instant. Yep. Yep. That is such a great point. And I think 
I don't, I don't know if the the guru world is quite like it was before, right? Like I just think when muscle mags were like the thing, I feel like they were like 10 or 15 people that like everybody kind of listened to. And now it's a lot easier because of social media, because of the reach and the platform that we all have access to. It's a lot easier to become that guru. But that's such a great point too, because we've seen it, right? Like we've right. seen firsthand when the house of cards falls, whether, you know, somebody is unscrupulous in their business practices, like you just mentioned, obviously the CrossFit thing and their founder, man, you've got to be, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to tell 20 year old Mike Robertson to think 10 or 15 years down the line. But I mean, that's kind of where you have to be now. Like you kind of really have to dive in and like, if you're going to associate yourself with a certain style of training or with a certain guru, like you've really got to kind of look not only at the training side of it, but all the back end side of it as well, because yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of bad things can happen if that person shows their true colors down the line. Sure. Yeah, and, and I think it, 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 another another part of it is if it's if it's all or nothing and one thing or nothing, then it could it could become nothing, and yes. you don't want to you don't you don't you don't want you know to be a hundred percent invested in something that somebody could take away from you. Absolutely. Or that could go away tomorrow. Absolutely. So I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to talk about media because. Obviously, that has changed a ton. I mean, I just think back to the way I consumed information growing up when I was in college, late 90s, like the Internet was becoming a thing, but there weren't like I don't even think T Nation was online until like 98 or 99, maybe something like that. So I was consuming my information from like bodybuilding magazines, right? It's like muscle and fitness and flex. So nowadays... Everybody can have their own brand, right? We've got Instagram and TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all these different platforms. So I'm really interested in your thoughts here. What do you think of the current state of media in the fitness industry? Back in the day, you know, and even going back before your time. Well, for example, when I first started early 1980s, if you wanted to get published, somebody else had to choose you. You had to submit yourself to a publication and they had to choose you. If you went on the air, you had to get chosen by a radio station to go on the air. If you were, you know, if you spoke at a conference, you couldn't, you know, you had to get chosen by somebody to speak at that conference. So when the internet comes along, and and by the way, if you try to do any stuff from your own, if you try to self-publish, you were automatically dismissed as a crank. Nobody took you seriously if you were out there self-publishing, you know, your 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 own books. Now, I know there were people who were making fortunes on mail order stuff that was invisible to the rest of us, but the people who were the most successful also tended to be people who had some at least had some presence in in the media for their niche. So they'd been in magazines, they were known to an audience, and that's how they were able to sell their stuff through through mail order. So then internet comes along, like you said, and we start off with these, you know, these message groups, and you've got people who are consistently like putting out good information in the groups, and they begin to develop kind of a following within those groups. And then we get these other social media platforms. People like me back in my magazine days would hear about these people and we would try to get them into our magazines. Sometimes if it worked out, they would get book deals, and eventually I think most of these people were able to do things on their own, put out their own products, publish their own books, launch their own websites, where they could kind of create their own reality. So they could build their own audience, they could keep their audience within their own ecosystem. That, I I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I don't, you know, I would never want to go back to the days where you had to depend on a gatekeeper to get in the front door, because if I were in that situation right now, I might have trouble getting in the door. And right. I think a lot of people who have been very successful might have trouble getting in the door if we still went back to those old rules. So I, I, I'm not nostalgic for those days, but well, here, here's here's one thing. I, I think even today, with the ability to create your own reality and to create your own image and become like this bigger than life thing based on your own self-presentation, I think most of the people who do well and who become well-known and well-respected still depend on somebody else at some point to give them a a leg up. It's somebody with a bigger audience than them shares their content. Somebody who puts on a big event, hears them 
speaking on a podcast maybe and invites them to come speak at this bigger event where they get to a bigger audience or somebody introduces them to somebody like say you somebody comes to you and it's like mike i want you to work on this project and you're like i'm, I'm way too busy for this but hey how about this guy yeah uh, that's a good point who, yeah you, right I, I i saw a post from this guy really smart why don't, why don't you you know i all right i've been in touch with this person i think they're really good at what they do i think they're on the way up why don't you you know, here, let me introduce you. So I think there's always, I heard somebody say this the other day, and I think it may have been on our, on our uh, PTDC podcast that still, after all these years, the currency of fitness is relationships. It's not money. It's yes. not how much money you make. It's what relationships you have, what connections you have, what networks you're a part of. And that I think it's it's hard to imagine that going away because if so many people are out there putting out fitness information to this massive audience and just throwing it out, most of it's just going out into the void. So the ones who break through tend to be the people who have the relationships and the networks. And now we go back to what we talked about three hours ago or whenever we started talking, which is <laughs> that these things take time. You cannot build a network overnight. You can't build these. You can't rush these relationships they take time to percolate. People have to trust you. If you're too eager, they probably aren't going to trust you. Very few people are able to fast track these things. So I, I think some of the old rules still apply. They just look different. You know, yeah. the platforms are different. But I think the standards of, of relationship building and, and network building still apply. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And kind of along those same lines, I think it's interesting because you and I both came up writing. You were actually like a serious like writer, like trying to write screenplays and working in the industry. And I was a dude that basically cheated his way through English class, you know, in middle and high school. And I just wrote because it made logical sense, because at the time that was the best medium to get right. information out there. Right. Now, the downside to this is I feel like and it makes me really sad to say this, but I feel like writing great content it to some degree is kind of dying out. So I'm really interested. Like, do you feel the same way? Do you think there's a time and place where writing will come back? Or am I just way off base here? You know, I think it depends on what you need to do to get your message out there. And by you, I mean the audience listening to this. Sure. And I think and, and and do you have an audience that's interested in reading? And right. I, I, I have I, I stand by my belief that people still like to read, that they don't like to be read to, that there's only so far you could go with spoken material. And even if you're, you know, even if somebody like says, well, I'd, I'd rather listen to an ebook than sit down and read the book on paper or on my Kindle. Well, still, somebody had to sit down and write that thing that they're listening to. <laughs> and if you listen to a podcast, say, where it's just a couple of people bullshitting with each other, how long are you going to listen to that before you tune out? So right. behind what they're talking about is written material. You and I prepared for this. You spent a lot of time working on the questions that you sent me. And I and I spent, you know, at least, I would say five minutes, maybe seven, thinking about it before <laughs> I got in the air. No, I actually typed out like a couple thousand words and we're not going to even get to most of it because, that, you know, I, I that's how I think things through is yes. by writing them down. And if that's you, I don't think writing is ever going to I, I don't think it's ever going to go away. The still it's the way we organize information. And I think it's the way a lot of people out there prefer to consume information, even if they want to consume it in a different format. So it still has to start with the written word. It still has to yeah. start down somebody writing down their ideas, presenting a case for something, presenting a new way to do something. And I don't know how you really get around that. I mean, there's nothing uh, – and, and I, I know I'm repeating myself here, but I don't think there's anything more tedious than like watching a video of somebody trying to sort through their – you know, sort through their <laughs> yes. ideas, you know, by having the camera on. I can sit down at my at my, uh, at my computer and I can work through ideas and I can – you know, and I might write for a half hour before I even write one good sentence or come up with one good thought. But I'm working, yeah. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And I'm not going to let anybody see that until I've spent some time on that thing. And I think it's the same way with all other forms of communication. If you're just spitballing and bullshitting and talking off the top of your head, you're not going to build an audience doing that. You've, you've got to do the work so the audience doesn't have to. You refine your idea before you present it to somebody. And I, I've always said that if you're if you're putting your first drafts out there for the world to see, you know, it's it's like it's like showing up for 
a job interview in your pajamas. You know, it, 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 <laughs> yeah. You you haven't you haven't shown anybody what you got. You've got to make yourself presentable before you can expect anyone to take you seriously. Yeah, you know that's such a great point because for me, one of the things that people have said over the years about my work is that I can take something complex and make it fairly simple. But what they don't understand is that was a complex jumbled mess in my head until I sat down and I hashed it out in that article where I basically made it simple as I fleshed the thoughts out in my brain. So that's such a great point. And it's something that I forget sometimes because even when I shoot video, and I don't know if everybody does this, but I'm kind of OCD like this. Even when I shoot video, I still have an outline. Sure. Right. Like it's and not it, like it I just your, your videos are, are some of the most are some of the most instructive you'll find anywhere because it's 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 so straightforward because you've thought it through before you turn the camera on. Right. Yeah. And I, I always tell people too. like I think a lot of times people fear being judged of that first draft. And you and I both know the first draft is I mean, literally, if anybody else sees that there's a problem <laughs> because right. I mean, yeah. I've got run ons. I've got, you know, just I'll get stuck on a thought and I'll just type in the words more here in caps and go on because I know like, look, I'm just trying to brain dump initially and then you kind of smooth it out and you maybe you take a walk and you have more thoughts. and You're like, oh, I should have said this. And you go back and it's very much a process. It's not you sit down and, you know, cut a vein and the the blood and the words come out at the same time. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Bleed on the page. Yeah. Bleed on the page. Right? Right? Once we're telling me about that. <laughs> Open up a vein and let it bleed. Yeah, it's that's like, right. Oh, I don't know. I think you should. <laughs> I think you should keep the blood in there and you should, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Yeah. Keep it in I, there. I did, yeah. Keep it in there. So, right. I want a tangent real quick because I feel like I've got a guy that's written for 28 years now, I think at time of recording. Well, just for fitness. That's not right. Just for writing, fitness. Right. Just for fitness. So would you mind sharing with me your process? Like when Lou Schuler has to get something great out into the world, what does your process look like? Okay. So again, I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my standard disclaimer, which is talking to a professional writer about how to write is like talking to a prostitute about how to have sex. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's there's the difference between doing something for fun and for, you know, professional advancement and satisfaction and versus talking to somebody who does it for a living. So if I describe my process, for one thing, I get paid to do this. So I don't have to compress everything I'm going to do that day into a into a window of of 60 to 90 minutes. You know, I've got I've got I've got a day to work this out when I do work. I it's 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 hard to say exactly what the process is, because I'll get sidetracked all the time, (laughs) either because of something that comes up that's work related or, you know, I'll, I'll be working on an article and I'll look at another article to make sure that I'm not repeating something we've done before. And then I'll look at that other article and it's like, holy crap, that's got like typos in it. And I'll go in and I'll, you know, and I'll fix it (laughs) up and and that, and that, and that may be, you know, so I bet that may take an hour there. And then I got back to my article and of course I've lost my train of thought, but if I wandered off in the train of thought, it wasn't probably, it wasn't a great train of thought to begin with. So that's fine. I'll start another train of thought. But other people don't have the luxury of being able to start and stop and jump off into tangents and go off and go off somewhere else. So my process probably isn't it it wouldn't be useful to other people. I can't tell you how to get off to a fast start. I know that when I was, you know, when I wasn't working for somebody full time and I was doing almost all my own writing on my own blog or on social media or something like that. A lot of times I would start my day by just like writing really long ass emails to people. And that was like how I sort of like, you know, that, that was my warm up. You right. know, it wasn't like okay. I had to warm up my fingers to type because that's not exactly, you know, an exertional activity at this point. Right. But I would I would do that just to sort of clear my thoughts. Uh-huh. I, you know, I used to love I used to love message boards back in the day because I could go in there and I could just like you know, write about something and, you know, maybe I don't know, getting into an argument is usually gets me in the wrong frame of mind for this sort of thing. Right. But I could but I could make a case for something, talk about something in the news or talk about something my favorite sports team did if I was on one of their message boards. And I really missed that. That was great. You know, I don't think mm-hmm. social media 
I, I don't think social media fills that gap just because it's so ephemeral. It just it's it's that day's post and then it's gone. Whereas right. back in the day, you could go back and you could find threads from a week ago or a month ago, and you could you know you could kind of you could you could keep a conversation going for a long time versus now, which is a conversation lasts at most on a on a popular Facebook post in the last a few hours, right? Right. That's interesting. Yeah, I I just know for me, and I I think most people that want to get into writing just need to understand like there is no like magic routine. I mean, I've read all the books about rituals and, you know, Stephen King writes for four hours, whatever, every morning. Like that's all great. Like figure out what works for you. You know, everybody's got a different routine, something that gets them in the right frame of mind. But I just felt like I would be doing us a disservice if I didn't ask you what your process was like, because that's always fascinating. And I, I don't know that I don't know that my process is is the same any two days. It depends on what the workload is, what the deadlines are. But I but again, I have that luxury because I have all day to, you know, I can I can I can plan what I'm going to write out weeks in advance if I know what the next, you know, what the next big initiative is at work, you know, with the PTDC, I can, I, I know what I'm going to be doing. And if I get pulled off that thing to work on something else, well, that's fine. That's what they're paying me to do is to be available right. to do stuff like that. Again, somebody else out there, I think there's, if nobody's paying you to do it, you definitely need to do some things that are just for the joy of doing them, for the joy of telling a story of relating something interesting, you know, sharing your thoughts about something. Here's 10 things I learned. Here's this thing is really popular right now, but I got to tell you, I've always been, I've always had a problem with it. And here's why. And it's not like you're, you're trying to get attention for yourself. You're just trying to do something that you really enjoy. You're trying to get something off your mind or force your mind to think about something in a new way. So it's, it's, you know, your, your motivation is primarily personal. I want to enjoy this thing I'm doing. Yep. Whereas with say a prostitute, they don't go into it thinking, Oh man, I really want to enjoy this one. You know, they, right. they, 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 oh, if it's not horrible, that's, you know, that's a win. <laughs> right. That, I love it. So I want to take one step back here and kind of look at like an overarching theme here, because whether we're talking about writing a podcast video, The overarching theme here is becoming a better communicator, right? Being able to communicate your thoughts, whether it be to another trainer or coach, the client or athlete standing in front of you. So new coach is listening in and they want to become a better communicator. And that could be any of those platforms. What advice would you give them? First, I think you have to know your you have to know your material. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, there's only so much you can know if you're, say, you know, a 22 year old who just, you know, got your got your degree in exercise physiology and you got your CSCS and you're just starting out. You only know what you know. But before you share what you know, I think you better be sure that you know it pretty well. You better be confident in what you're doing. Second, I think you have to know who you're sharing this information with. If you're trying to share it with everybody, you're not going to you're not going to reach anybody. That's like one of the oldest clichés in in writing is if you write for everybody, you write for nobody. One bit of advice, and I actually came up with this on my own and it didn't realize until years later that this was like a standard piece of advice. I just never come across it, which is that when you write, focus on one person. Tell a story to one yes. person. Picture one person. Give that person a name. If if it's even if it's a composite character, make that person real in your head. And the more real that person is, the easier it's going to be for you to tell your story to that person to share information with that person. If you're sitting there thinking, okay, I'm up on the mountaintop and you know I'm 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 shouting out to you know to all these assembled the people, who can't wait to hear what I say. Yeah, nobody's going to pay any attention. Everyone's going to think you're a jerk. Yes, I, that's. Yes, that's such a good piece of advice. And that's something that it it took me a while to figure that out too. But like, and that's true of everything, right? That can be an article, a video, an email, right? Like if you do email blasts, I hate that term, but like if you're sending an email to multiple people, write it as though you're writing to one because nobody wants to hear, oh, so you all probably think like immediately as a reader, you're turned off by that versus you probably think. You're like, oh, yeah, well, maybe I do think that. And you make a great point there as well is not just in your writing, but like we talked about marketing before. 
if you're not pissing half the people off, it's probably not very attractive marketing. Yeah. Right. Like, like that's yeah. part of it. And you I, see I that know. in marketing politics, everything now, right? Like if you're not turning right. half the people off, you're doing a poor job. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that it even has to be half in, in marketing. This is something that Adam Campbell, who I think, you know, yeah. you know, right, right from he's with, uh, I think he's the editor in chief of Precision Nutrition now, but Adam and I actually hired Adam at Men's Health back in back in 2000. So we've yeah. known each other for for 20 years. I remember Adam saying that the most effective social the the most effective content back when he was the editor of the of Men's Health dot com. 75 people are like, oh, hell yeah, when they read it. And they just can't wait to share because it's like what they've been, you know, oh, man, this is what I think. And this, they said it so well. And I can't wait to share this with people. Right. And then like 25 percent are so pissed off that anybody <laughs> said this thing that they share it with their friends. So it's like, can you believe this asshole said this about this? I think they're wrong. They're horrible. They're in the pocket of, you know, big hamburger right. or, or whatever, whatever their, <laughs> you know, whoever their boogeyman is that week. Right. And now you've got most people like it and they like it a lot. And this other segment hates it. I think if you're 50 50. I don't know. Like you said, in politics, it's a 50-50 world. And that's and that's fine. And maybe in some things like if you're talking about sports. Yeah, maybe you can get away with pissing off 50 percent of people because they'll, right. they'll hate much. But I think that in fitness, you need a better ratio than that. Yes. And, I, and whatever Adam told me back then, whether it was 75 percent, 80 percent love your message and 20 percent hate it, you just need enough hate to where those people help amplify the message to the people who are going to love it. Yeah. That's your, that's sort of your, that's sort of your sweet spot. So I don't, I don't think there's much value in, in getting, in getting a, I don't know, anytime your, your haters start getting up above 40 to, you know, <laughs> approaching 50%, I really think you're doing something wrong. Yes. I, think, I think you, you have maybe earned their hate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. The 50, 50 split came more from politics, but I could get yeah. behind 75, 80, Right. If you're if you're doing that, you're you're putting out pretty good stuff for sure. Okay. Well, sure. Yeah. And and you know, and, it, and it's also if you have eighty percent of the people reading it love it, then you've probably got people in your network who are helping you amplify that. You've probably got relationships yep. of people who appreciate and endorse your your message. Maybe you're amplifying somebody else's message, and you know, obviously, you're giving credit to that person, so they're going to help you amplify that message because they got credit in it. So you're doing a lot of things right and a lot of the things that we've talked about. Yeah. Now, one other thing you said, we were talking about speaking to one person. Yep. And again, this circles way back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that point of identification, that person who has never, if you can identify with that person who has been scarred by their inability to do something that you're now going to show them to do, or somebody who has been teased about their weight or their athletic ability or somebody who just has always wanted to do this thing but didn't think it was something they could do, thought something other people could do. If you have a point of identification with that person, it's going to make your message much more powerful. Yeah. And they're not going to even notice that you've blasted this email out to however many followers you have, whether it's 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, because it still feels like you're speaking directly to them. Yeah, great point, man. Okay. Big question time, my friend. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Lou Schuler one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? Me, personally, if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to get diagnosed and treated for ADHD because really? I did that in the early 2000s, say 2000, yeah, probably about 2000. Every single thing I've done that everybody's ever heard of came after I got diagnosed and treated for ADHD. And really? it completely changed my career path. It's certainly, I don't think I'd be married now. I don't think I'd be living with my wife and my three kids in this house we've lived in for 22 years. I don't think any of that would have happened if I hadn't acknowledged the problem, gotten help and gotten treatment. And so I don't know how many people that applies to in the fitness industry. I think there's a lot of ADHD and, and for a lot of people, it's not a problem. And if it's not a problem, don't worry about it. Go with it. It could be a gift. You know, right. you could focus intensely on one thing or that you can bounce, you know, and other times you can bounce around from thing to thing to thing until you find something to land on. Yeah, that just means you're that's just who you are and you're curious and you're probably going to broaden your scope and at the same time being a, be able to focus intensely on the one thing that's most important within your scope. Yeah. So that could be fine. It could be a superpower. In my case, it was a detriment and it was holding me back. 
and getting treated, I, I, I think, uh, I would say to this day was the, was the smartest thing I ever did. I just wish, and I don't even wish I'd done it younger because everything I did when I was younger led up to that point. Right. But if I were to go back and give myself advice to somebody who had not yet lived the life I've lived, I'd say, yeah, do, do yourself a favor. You're, you're going to be a lot happier and your life's going to be a lot smoother if you do this one thing now rather than waiting. I love it. I love it. All right, my guy, last but not least, we got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions, but your answer can be as short or long as you like. So let's jump in. Number one, what's your career highlight so far in the fitness industry? Boy, you know, they, I, I don't think there's I don't think there's just one. Well, give me a handful. I, OK, well, I think the first time I well, the first time I won an award, that was really something. I mean, I was so stunned. I was sitting there and it was when I was at Men's Fitness. That's an award nobody's ever heard of. It was like a Maggie Award, which is given out the Western Publication Association. So the entire publishing industry is on the East Coast. Right. But this is for west of the Mississippi so okay. that, you know, the publications, that, and there were a lot more of them back there, including the Weeder magazines were all based out in L.A. Yeah. So we applied, you know, we entered some contest and we won some awards. And I remember, you know, the first time I was sitting at this awards dinner and we actually won one. And this was against... You know, we're the other nominees in the category were much bigger, much bigger than us. And, you know, in one case, it was like a celebrity columnist for a magazine. And it was, you know, it was mainly my stuff that got nominated. And I remember just sitting there just being so stunned. It's like, awesome. you know, you fantasize your whole life. And it's like I said, it was a award nobody's ever heard of. I don't, I don't even think I put it on. You know, I, I can't remember last time I even put it on my social media unless there's like an old bio on my website that right. I haven't dated you know, in ages. So that was like, that was one, I think seeing my books, seeing my first book was a testosterone advantage plan. And I think it was like the day after Christmas in 2001. Oh, you know what? I actually know what was the greatest day of my career. Oh, um, let's go. I can, I can tell you this. I can, I can narrow it down right now. So I had just, Alan and I had just published the new rules of lifting for abs, which was our, our core training book. Yeah. And it was kind of like also our Mia Culpa book where we're like, okay, these first two books, New rules of lifting, new rules of lifting for women. They were like all barbell training, no excuses, all this kind of stuff. And this was kind of our mea culpa. This was like, yeah, you got, there's a lot of other stuff going on here. Right. And this was our acknowledgement more of, of the, of the, you know, certainly the role of the core, the importance of, you know, sort of building, you know, building your fitness from your weak points out. Yes. And the book came out, it did okay. And I'm thinking, ah, all right, well, this is, I'm going to have to find, I'm going to find something else to do because this is not, you know, this, this is not going well. And I think this is February, 2010. So my friend, Nick Bromberg had worked for Yahoo and there was this new site sub, you know, this new site within Yahoo that they were launching called the post game. And it was like a sports type of, you know, I forget what, I forget what the original goal was, but they did some fitness stuff and he wanted to interview me about my new book. And so I thought I was doing this young guy a favor by like helping him with this article. The article comes out and it goes viral. And like within hours, my, this book, which had been, God, I don't even think it was like in the top thousand or 5,000 on Amazon. Within hours, it's in like the top 20, 30. Oh, wow. And it's just like, and it's going up and up and up. And this book ended up, oh, geez, I haven't looked at this in so long. But it ends up like number two, I think, on Amazon overall. Wow. And you know how people say, oh, you know, best selling author, multiple yeah. best selling author. And they're always like referring to, yeah, you know, you were you were like number one in some weird ob the most obscure, obscure niche. Yeah. You, right. Some some category. And you, maybe you even created the category just to become number one in that. This was overall. This was Amazon.com, and this was the number two overall book. And to this day, I'm pissed off that we didn't get to number one. The number one book was a vegan book by somebody who was the wife of a major Hollywood producer. And it's like wow. that is not fair. You know, <laughs> Ellen and I, you know, we love our we love our spouses, but they are not Hollywood producers. We did right. this, you know. That's <laughs> we, awesome. Th this was this was two people who were nobodies who you know who put out a book, and it's you know, and and we're. You know, we built our reputations the hard way. We didn't have any, you know, no shortcuts. And we were number two on Amazon. And I just, it's like, God damn, why did this one vegan book, it just, right. book, it just you're fine. You're rich. You're going <laughs> to die rich. Just let us have number one. Right. But still getting to number two. Oh, and, I'll, and the reason it was so important was because we got our first two book deals for the next two New Rules books 
because of that one day, because I was thought I was doing this young friend of mine a favor by helping him with his article, which ended up putting my book into this level where I'd never been before. Yeah. Well, I hope you bought that guy an adult beverage after that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're still good friends. And yeah, he, he actually was uh, became the host of the Fitness Summit. So I've, I was EMC there for many years. Nice. Nice. So, okay. Love it. I love it. Okay. Number two, what's your new position like with the PTDC? You know, it changes all the time. Everything that we've talked about, all the things that change all the time, that that describes my position there. I'm the I'm the editorial director, but that could mean something different from one week to the next. So it it depends on what the priorities are. One week I might be copy editing a textbook or writing a textbook even. Another day, you know, it, it might just be the regular, you know, the articles. I, I we put out a weekly newsletter. Uh, weekly feature called Best Fitness Content, which I also work on. So there's like some stuff that I do every week, but everything else is just what the company needs at that moment. So there's always gotcha. lots of balls up in the air, but that's, you know, that's kind of, I think the same for anybody who, and that's the way publishing has always been. Absolutely. Okay. Number three, you've been in the media and content game in the fit fitness industry for 28 years now. So I feel like you got a lot of insights as to what's going on. What should we be on the lookout for in the years to come? You know, if I had an answer to that, I probably would have gotten a lot farther than than, than <laughs> I ever have. I've never been I've never been good at guessing what came next. I remember yeah. back in say 2000 at Men's Health saying our readers really want to be they they don't think of us as this magazine that comes out every month. They want to be engaged with us on a daily basis. We should exploit that. We should do more with our website. And I talked them into setting up a message board, fitness message board on menshealth.com. And I spent a lot of time doing that. So that was one time where I thought I, I was ahead. I saw yep. this was going to be the next big thing. Everything else that came along, I didn't think was, I wasn't interested in it. You know, Facebook, I signed up and I didn't really figure out how to use it for a couple of years. <laughs> Twitter, I never really figured out how to use it. I just signed up. Every, everything else, every other social platform, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up just so nobody would take my name. Not right. that anybody would these days, but back then, that, that yes. was an extra risk. Yeah. So I've never been good at figuring out. If you would have told me, you know, pre-Instagram, how big Instagram was going to be, I would have been, you gotta, you got to be kidding me. That's right. the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> put up pictures and they write little captions and hashtags. Are yeah. you kidding me? I know. I know. All right. Well, okay. we'll skip the crystal ball then. Because I don't know what's coming next either. That's why I asked you. So, <laughs> number four, <laughs> number four. I mean, it, it, I, I think what what we know is that there will be a market for what we do. That you're yeah. going to have clients that you train, and I'm going to be writing about fitness, nutrition, health in some way or another. Those things are still going to be in demand, and we're still going to be doing them. So that's what's next for us. Other people who are on the way up again patients, what is going on and right now, what your opportunities are right now, aren't going to be your opportunities a year or two from now. So you, you can make, you can make some choices. You can go down some dead ends, just, you know, gi give yourself opportunities to do very, to do more than one thing to try to discover what you like. But at the same time, Avoid getting yourself into too narrow a niche too early in your career yes. because if something happens to that niche, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're stuck. Yep. You're going to completely reinvent yourself. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Number four, what's next for Lou Schuler? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? I love the job I have. What I'm excited about is what I've always been excited about, which is what I have been for at least a couple of decades now, which is maybe I can share something with someone in a way that they haven't seen before that catches them at the exact right moment. And I'm going to have a genuine impact on that person. Somebody is going to remember that article years from now. Somebody's going to remember that book or even, you know, that's a problem with social media. You can't say, God, somebody may remember that tweet five years from now. Right. Be, nobody's going to remember your no. tweet five years from now. But I hope that something I'm working on right now or that I'll be working on next week or next month or next year will have a genuine impact on somebody's career. And since I'm addressing personal trainers at this point through, you know, through John Goodman's platforms, you know, maybe something we publish will help a personal trainer stay in the business long enough 
that they can have a genuine impact on the people they train, that they can help people because we help them stay in the industry. They can help their clients achieve things that are important to their clients. So that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping for is that it's not that I'm thinking about my mortality, but I definitely love the idea that something I'm working on right now is going to have a bigger impact than anyone anticipates. Yeah. No, I love that, man. And I am right there with you. So, Lou, you've been awesome to catch up with today, my friend. It's been far too long. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great stuff that you're working on? Well, I, I do have a website, but I haven't updated it since like 2014. And it's not, <laughs> you know, as as Google keeps reminding me, it's not mobile friendly. Yeah. So, so you know, LouSchiller.com. Yeah, you can go there, but you're not going to get much out of it because <laughs> uh, even I sometimes forget it exists. So I'm, you know, work at the PTDC, the PTDC.com. We have a weekly newsletter, which I think is, is, is valuable. It's, you know, entertaining, fun to read. And other than that, I think if you, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll pretty much never miss anything important I'm doing because it, you know, it ends up there somehow. Yeah. And I know Facebook is like, oh, that's just what old people do. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I still think okay. Facebook does exactly what we want social media to do. So, you know, it's a shame about the fascism and all that. But, you know, it's it's I think it's I think it is. I, I, I still think it's a great communication platform. And I don't say that about other platforms. No, I agree, man. Well, Lou, Lou, again, thanks so much for coming on, man. It was really great to catch up with you here today. Mike, thank you so much. You know, I hope you managed to dig out that old the first podcast we did because yes. that was officially the first time I went on a rant on a on a podcast. And I think I've tried to do it on every podcast since then. I don't know if anything <laughs> I say qualifies as a rant or just a, or, or just me talking. But the very first one was on your podcast all those years ago. So I'm 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 very nostalgic about that and hope this one is up to that standard. Absolutely. I will do everything in my power to dig that thing up. I've got it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Nothing ever dies in the internet age. That's true. That's true. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with Lou. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. He is one of those guys that, like many of the people on this show, I've connected with at numerous points in my career. You know, we've had times where we've interacted a bunch, gone, you know, months, if not years without interacting, but a guy I just think the world of, and somebody that has a truly unique perspective on the fitness industry. He has worked with pretty much everybody. Like he's like a who's who compendium of fitness coaches, strength coaches, and somebody that I just think the world of. So regardless of whether you've been in the game for a month, a year, a decade, hopefully you took a thing or two away from my interview with Lou, especially about communication skills and how to use media to make yourself a more successful trainer or coach. Now, if you enjoyed this week's show, I've got one or two things to ask for you. Number one, if you're not already subscribed to the show, take two seconds out of your day. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, any streaming platform service that has the Physical Prep Podcast. Click the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. If you're already subscribed, thank you. I'm trying to get to 200 rankings and reviews on the iTunes. So if you would take one to two minutes out of your day, head over to iTunes, rank and review the show. Love to hear your feedback. Love to know what your favorite episode was or something that just positively impacted you. Again, as a trainer or coach, what episode did you like the best? How has it improved your skills or why do you look forward to it each and every week? So if you could do that for me, I would really appreciate it. I think if we get to 200, 250 reviews, that would be really awesome. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Thanks for tuning in each and every week. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.